my other favorite client was Hershey Chocolate. There's a reason. Besides the fact that they, of course, paid, the conversation with the secretary got to something really important. Did you like dark chocolate or did you like milk chocolate? Well, we had these intelligent, brilliant conversations, and I said, I just didn't like Almond Joys. I was a Mounds Bar girl. I'm a dark chocolate girl. In fact, not to date myself completely, but back in the day, after school, four days a week, I'd actually spend a quarter and buy a Mounds Bar. Have you seen a Mounds Bar for a quarter? I don't think so. A quarter of a Mounds Bar cost a quarter. But when I got to the speech, there was this huge box for me, which they handed to me afterwards. And I knew from just old math from fifth grade that it was a gross of candy bars. And I'm thinking, oh, no such thing as gross and candy bars in the same sentence. And I opened it up. And I was actually shocked. And I was probably not the most gracious person, because it looked like there were 124 Mounds bars, yay and 20 Almond Joys. <laughs> and I couldn't help but be maybe a little less than gracious, and I said, Joanne, we had this conversation. I love that you gave me all these candies. My thighs wouldn't have loved it, but I love that you gave me all these candy bars, but why would you include Almond Joys? And then she looked at me and said something that was utterly brilliant. She didn't make it up, but it showed how when everyone is on message, the message gets sent loudly. She looked at me totally deadpan and said, Susan, sometimes you feel like a nut. <laughs> Welcome. You're here because you have to hire a speaker for a convention, a meeting, a conference, or maybe just a luncheon keynote. And you want someone who's knowledgeable, experienced, motivating, and who gets the desired results you want when mingling is mandatory, when networking is absolutely necessary, and when conversations are critical to establish the connections that people need to build those long-standing and long-term business relationships. Hello, I'm Susan Rowan, and I'm the author of How to Work a Room, The Secrets of Savvy Networking, and Face to Face, How to Reclaim the Personal Touch in this digital world. And I invite you to watch my video and see me in action. And you have in your handout something I made up for How to Work a Room's 21st birthday, 21 Tips, where I went and looked at how do we break it down? How can we take easy steps so that it doesn't seem so overwhelming. Because the reality is, you walk into a room, there are 90 people, there are 50 people, there are 40 people you don't know. It feels overwhelming. But how do you break it down? It's little steps. Because when we walk into a room and we're so worried about who we're going to meet and what we're going to say, what I'd like to say, and I'd like you to write this down because I am a former teacher, which is why I'm wearing sensible low-heeled shoes, and, and that is that you bring who you are to what you do. People connect with who you are. What you do is often secondary. We need to make it easy for people to talk to us. So whether it's same senior parents or kids or interests or where you went to school or where you were born, when we bring who we are to what we do, we make it easier. Because instead of working a room, what we're doing is having fun in a room. One of the women that came to a session that I did in San Francisco said she goes to the chamber out in Walnut Creek with her husband there in business together. She said, we find these events daunting. The chamber, all the different groups. And one day they went to an event and they met three different people and they had a blast. She said, yes, we're gonna do business together, but we had such fun, we were laughing the whole time. Wouldn't you like to go somewhere and just be laughing the whole time? She said what it did is it changed their attitude. Completely changed their attitude. Instead of going to these events where they go, 
Ugh, I wonder who I'm going to get to meet. By the way, do you like the ugh in front of it? It adds a little sound. Ugh, who am I going to get to meet? What am I going to say? They said that one night changed their attitude. So now what they literally say to each other physically, out loud, before they go to an event where they're promoting their business is, I wonder who we're going to get to meet. Wow, who are we going to get to meet? And when your attitude changes to, ah, there are going to be some interesting people there. And maybe we will have job leads. Or maybe we'll find out about a great book club. Or maybe we'll learn that there's an additional exit off the freeway that allows us to avoid traffic. That's the person I want to meet. I wonder who we get to meet. But working room is work. I'm going to talk about roadblocks, what stops us, some remedies, and we're going to talk about savvy networking in this face-to-face -face age. Because we are in a digital age, and yet we still have to have face-to-face -face skills. But how do we meet people we need to meet? So it really happens at all levels. But the one thing I said to them, and I say to all my audiences, and I would say to you is, if your answer to Ron's question if you've ever walked into a room full of people and felt uncomfortable is yes, that means you're normal. Because the reality is over 90% of us self-identify as shy. When they asked Dr. Zimbardo, what do you attribute this amazing increase in people who are shy? What is the reason? And he said one word, technology. Technology has made us shyer. It's very controversial. Has technology really made us lose our social skills? The answer is yes. There we have. We, some people say yes. We all know people who would rather text us than even have a conversation with us. And we think it's the younger people. No, it is not. What is the number one skill that people who will succeed have. Dr. Nathan Kaifetz in the 80s was the professor of emeritus of sociology at Harvard. And he said something that has so been proven true, it's almost frightening. He said in the year 2000, we'll all be technical. Don't, aren't we all technical? Doesn't everyone email, use a computer, etc.? But he said in the year 2000, who will succeed will be the people who can talk to other people. He didn't say email. He didn't say fax. He said the people who can talk to other people. The roof is the introduction. And that means if you're all under the same roof, you have something in common. We had to find a parking space. We encountered traffic. We had to leave work at a certain time. We had to grab a bite on the way in. You never know. You never know. Gee, I don't know why I should get dressed and go there. And what did your grandmother say? You never know. And these are the great women, the grandmothers of yesteryear, who when you said to them, oh, that didn't work out, what would they say? It wasn't meant to be. But if something did work out, and you got so excited, and you told your grandmother, what did she say? It was meant to be. This, the explanation's ingenious. But it's you never know. Because we don't know. But I'll tell you one thing I do know. That if we don't come to phase two careers, if we don't go to the chambers, if we don't go to the Rotary, if we don't show up to Toastmasters, the National Speakers Association, and the breast cancer fundraiser, we don't have the opportunity to meet the other people who may be the absolute best people we should meet. There's nothing that replaces face to face because something <laughs> happens in that space in a conversation, the serendipity, the exchange, the eye contact, the way you can see someone smile. You can't get that anywhere else. Now, you could see that on Skype, but you can't say, wasn't that funny? Unless you want to hit your computer. <laughs> Here's how we remedy when there are no trumpets and no one to introduce us. And by the way, when you go to an event with someone, 
and they say there's gonna, they're going to introduce you around, they're only going to introduce you to the people they want to introduce you to, which may have no relationship to the people you might want to meet and strike up a conversation. Remember, that's a term. I'd like you to write that down. Strike up a conversation. Here's your remedy. Everywhere you go, before you go, have a planned, practiced self-introduction. Planned and practiced, so that you really aren't caught off guard. So that when you walk in a room, you know how you're going to introduce yourself and what you are going to say about yourself. And then you're not at a loss for words. And that self-introduction, now, you may have heard people at networking events say, oh, you have to have an elevator speech, and it has to be 15 seconds. If you're going on 15 seconds about yourself, that elevator better be in what we used to call the Sears Tower. <laughs> that is an awfully long self-introduction. Three aspects to the Rowan self-introduction. Because remember, this is a social situation. First, it is seven to nine seconds. I'm going to tell you why. Well, I wondered why I've been saying that for centuries. And then I went back and read my book, and I went, that's why I've been saying it. I had forgotten that research on eye contact is that seven to nine seconds is eye contact. But after nine seconds, it's considered a glare. <laughs> I was in a Zumba class, and there was a young gal who really can dance well. And I said to her, you should come to our 10, 15 Wednesday morning class. She says, well, you know, I, I work. I like, like, I don't, but I didn't want to say that to her. Um, I, I said, really, what do you do? And Heather looked at me and smiled and said, I teach horses how to dance. <laughs> really? I thought she was going to bring one to our class. <laughs> I said, really, what do you do? And she smiled and said, I teach dressage where you teach horses how to dance. Beautifully said. And it started a conversation. Because though I am definitely not a horse person, I have a friend who takes dressage. I love to get up in the middle of the night and watch it on the Olympics. It's fascinating. How do you do that? What's your background? It started a conversation. What she did is what Patricia said. She gave the benefit not her job title. And that connected us in a way that surprisingly would not have happened if she just said, oh, I teach dressage. She amused me. She engaged me. She gave me an opportunity to ask the first question. Because there's two parts of working a room. And in this face-to-face -face space in this digital world, one is being interesting and the other is being interested. One is the person who approaches people, but even more important is to make sure that in every room we are approachable. I did this program, and it was funny, and people were taking notes. And then someone in the fifth row was glaring at me. Well, do you think that I cared that 349 people were taking notes and having a good time? No. All I could think of from standing on the stage, trying to remember my talk, trying to engage the audience is, what's wrong with her? And then I figured out why she was glaring, because she could figure out that the nail polish on this finger was chipped. <laughs> but here's the lesson. After the talk, this woman with, you know the face that your mother said, Watch out, your face will freeze that way. <laughs> that, that face, she came up to me, and with the same glowering glare, she said to me, Susan, that was the best talk I ever saw. <laughs> All I could think of is, what does she look like when she's really having a bad time? <laughs> Let us be sure that we are smart enough never to distance someone whose language 
first language might be from another country. I wrote this in What Do I Say Next? If you decide that you would only talk to people who are easy to understand, you would be making a grievous error because in the Silicon Valley, where deals are done and contacts are made face to face, I saw it happen at TechCrunch on Monday. You will be talking with people, because they had pavilions. There was the Korean pavilion, the Israeli pavilion, the Brazilian pavilion, the Chilean pavilion. The, you would be making a big mistake. There was a, an area from people from India you would be making a grave mistake if you discounted people whose English sounded different than yours, because they could be the person that would give you the lead to the next best job. People think, oh, good things come to those who wait. Give, let me give you the Roanne version. Good things come to those who initiate. Who initiate. You pick up the phone. You met someone. Don't wait a week. You met someone here. Send them an email. And because it's a combination of digital, offline, and online, if you met someone and you had an interesting conversation, go to LinkedIn and invite them to link in with you. Now, I'm going to give you the please don't do this. Do not ever use LinkedIn's. Please join me on LinkedIn, their standard. What that will show is that you paid no attention, that you're not creating a personal relationship. Tell the person how you met them. Remind them. Because we're all meeting a lot of people. Remind me where we met. Watch their eyes. If their eyes are beginning to wander to see who else is in the room, that's a sign that they're ready to leave. You will be well thought of if you help them make that exit because they most likely don't know how to do it comfortably. Everywhere we go, here's another thing that gives us something to talk about. Do something different that you normally don't do. Do you have an oh wow friend as you go through career transitions? We all need an oh wow friend. And by the way, if we aren't that for other people, we need to bring those two words into our vocabulary. Oh, wow. And while everyone is sending an email, if you want to really stand out, pick up the phone and make a call. Let's use the digital, but let's not lose our analog. A great host is a great introducer. They put people together. In fact, in Secrets of Savvy Networking, I had a chapter. I didn't intend to have this chapter, but it came to me in a burning bush, and I quite like the title of it. Networker, networker, make me a match. And may all the rooms you work be full of nice people like you.